Well, welcome everyone to week four of our office hours, sort of our little food nerd talks that we're doing every week here. Um, in the absence of being able to do cooking classes, we've opened these up so that um, you can ask any kind of food or culinary or nutrition or gardening, food gardening question that you would like. Uh, and if I don't know, I'll find out for you. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, which I encourage you to do at any time, uh, Krista Gibson and Carmen Reeves are handling the tech. Thank you, ladies. And uh, they will let me know if you have a question and we can talk about it. You can do that by raising your hand in Zoom, um, or you can put it in the chat in Zoom, or you could message on Facebook. So those three things, those are the three ways that you can ask questions. So why don't we go ahead and introduce uh, the weird food of the week. Everyone, do you know what this is? It's tamarind. So also in the Latin world, the Latinx world, um, it's called tamarindo, um, also called tamon, suquer, um, and it's actually uh, from the Arab word for, it's uh, tamar indi, and that means, um, it means uh, Indian fig, or Indian date, excuse me. Uh, so I wanna show you how to eat these. Lots of people, you can, you can actually find this in lots of products, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but for those of you that are just seeing this for the first time, this is the most popular globally used ingredient that you've never heard of. So uh, this is a tamarind pod. It comes from a leguminous tree that grows huge, 50, 60 feet, and it grows in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. Uh, it is native to uh, Africa, actually, in the tropical regions of Africa for literally thousands of years, um, where it's been used as uh, food and medicine. Um, and through the Silk and Spice Road, if you don't know what that is, look it up because it's amazing. It's how we had in the Eastern world, how there was all sorts of uh, trade um, in spices, in silks, in um, in, in, in people all across uh, the Eastern world. Um, and then once Columbus came over here, there was a Colombian exchange where, um, you know, corn and chilies went to the Eastern world and things like um, uh, tamarind and, and all sorts of other things, all of the, you know, rice and things like that came to the Western world. And when I mean Eastern world, I mean Eastern hemisphere. And when I say Western world, I mean Western hemisphere. So let's break into this bad boy because you don't just bite into it. You have to take the peel off. So let me show you. It's real brittle because we can't get tamarind fresh. Uh, well, we can't get tamarind fresh in this country, but it mainly grows in places with no frost. So mainly Southern Florida. Uh, so if you peel off the outside of it, it's sticky. Um, and then it has these veins here and you're gonna peel those off, okay? So peel those off. Uh, my seeds kids right now, the ones that are online with me are actually able to sample this with us. So I would love to hear your comments on what you think of this, because to me, this is nature's candy. Um, anytime I introduce this to kids, they can never get enough of it. Uh, mainly because it is sweet, but it's also very sour. And that is extremely, extremely popular in today's uh, candies. You'll see that a lot um, with, uh, you know, the, uh, the little like gummies that have the sugary coating on the outside and the real, real, the real, real sweet and uh, super sour when you suck on them. Very popular for about the last 15 years. So this is what the pod looks like on the inside. There's some hard little seeds. You aren't going to eat those. You're just gonna bite in and eat the pulp off the outside. It's pretty sour. It's good though. And then you spit out the seeds. So you'll see that this guy, whoo, that is sour. Mm, is about eight seeds long. This one's about three seeds long. These can actually get to about up to 20 seeds long. So it just depends on the type of variety that you get. Um, but they're all the same species. There's only one tree um in the tamarind family um but yeah it's nice and sticky sometimes you'll get these and they're so dry they're like fruit leather and sometimes they'll be a little bit wetter but they always reduce the they always dry them out and reduce the water to activity enough that it can't grow bacteria so um i want to show you this my seeds kids also got this so 
This is how you will find tamarind, one of the ways it's consumed in Mexico. So um, like I was saying, tamarind is produced worldwide now, um, anywhere in a temperate, warm region where, uh, you know, where and, and this, this tree can grow in, in lots of different kinds of soil, clay, it can grow in volcanic soil, it can grow in acidic or alkaline soils, the thing can grow anywhere so long as it doesn't get cold and it's warm enough for the seeds to dry out on the tree before they drop. So in Mexico, in about the 16th century, um, tamarind was taken to Mexico, and Mexico is one of the major producers of tamarind um, in the Latin world. And um, this is, uh, it's tamarind, but it has sugar and chili added to it. You'll see uh, in Mexico, it's primarily made into drinks. Uh, if you've ever had uh, agua aguas, uh, there's two different kinds of like major drinks that um, are, are really popular in Mexican cuisines. Besides sodas, there's uh, licuados, which are like uh, fruit smoothies, and then there are aguas. So you see like um, agua de fresa, which is like uh, strawberry water, and you'll see agua de tamarindo. And you can actually buy canned tamarind juice um, in Latinx grocery stores. So check that out. It's, I think it's like Jumex or Hume. Um, there's some other brands that sell it, and it's really tasty. It's really refreshing. You can also um, take the pulp like this and you can just mix it with water and sugar and make an, an agua de tamarindo. But um, I grew up eating these as a kid because I grew up real close to the border of Mexico and some of the kids would go down like once a week and go down uh, below the border and probably pay five or 10 cents a piece for these and come up and sell them two for a dollar. This and chamoy, chamoy is this, 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 like salted plums. Um, and I would eat these every day pretty much for like at least a decade. Um, so when I was a kid, I would just tear the corner off with my teeth, but I'm going to go ahead and cut the corner off because I'm a civilized adult now. And uh, it actually has the seeds in it. So um, you can work around those or you can just um, put them in your mouth and then spit them out when you're done. That brings back memories, I'll tell you what. Woo. Even with the sugar added, it's still pretty sour. Woo. So um, I want to show you these two because these are from... Um, an Indian grocery store. You can find tamarind in lots of different um, cuisines. Uh, uh, India is the major producer, even though tam who's that sour? Even though tamarind is native to Africa, um, through the Spice Road or the Silk Road, same thing. Um, this ended up in India, and it's been planted for so long from seed that different varieties have. Um, have been cultivated over time, and India is the major producer of um, of tamarind now, almost to the point that people think that it's indigenous there, but it's not. It's just been grown there for thousands of years. Uh, even Romans knew about tamarind, so that's how long it's been being produced. So this is called wet tamarind. You can, and it's actually like a really hard. All it is is tamarind that's been cooked off the seed and dried out. And it just, just means that it's like kind of squishy. You can actually get it where it's completely dehydrated like fruit leather. Um, and you'll use this. They make chutneys out of this. Um, if you've ever gone to an Indian restaurant and gotten samosas and they come to the table and they're like a little uh, fried pocket of like uh, peas and potatoes and things. And, it, and they'll bring to the table a green chutney, which is kind of like a salsa or a sauce. Um, and they'll bring a brown chutney and that's a tamarind chutney and it's sweet and sour and spicy. They add a lot of things to it, but this is a major ingredient. Um, this is uh, also used in Chinese cuisine, Taiwanese cuisine, Philippine cuisine, you name it. There's all sorts of sour soups that people make it out of. Um, uh, all kinds of chutneys, drinks, candies, you name it. Um, it's, it's been used uh, medicinally in Ayurvedic medicine, which is uh, the uh, sort of natural um, uh, medicine sort of, um, it's like the, the natural health system of India for like 5,000 years, um, as long as they've been writing things down pretty much. Uh, and they use this, this is very popular in that medicine. It's, it's um, been used for lots of things, but um, also constipation. That's it's very rich in fiber. So um, we talked about rich in fiber last week. So um, this one's really nice because it doesn't have any seeds in it. And you can use this when you just really simply mix together. Um, it's, our, it's real liquidy and you mix it together with, uh, you know, it's ready to use to either make a drink, to make a sauce, 
Um, this is pretty well refined, but it's 100% tamarind with just some more water in it. So you don't have to fish the seeds out of it or rehydrate it or anything. So all of these forms are equal and equally delicious. Uh, another great thing about tamarind is it, um, it is not only useful for food, uh, but for thousands of years um, in Buddhist temples, um, they've used it because it's so acidic, they've used it to shine um, metal instruments. So things like um, brass statues, uh, it takes the green oxidation off of copper really well. Uh, before we had sort of our modern uh, chemicals that we use for shining up metals and making them beautiful, uh, tamarind has been used frequently for that over, over thousands of years. Um, and that is because it is rich in tartaric acid. So this is our vocabulary word of the day, mainly acid, but tartaric acid in particular. So acids, you know if a food is rich in acid, if it's acidic, because it's gonna be sour. So if something really makes you pucker, it means that it has a high amount of acid in it. One other little thing I wanted to add in here real quick before we go into acids, is that tamarind, it's a bean, but it's technically a fruit because it has seeds in it. And what's rare for fruits is they're rarely rich in calcium and uh, tamarind is rich in calcium. That's why I call it nature's candy. It tastes like candy, but it's really rich in nutrients. Vitamin B, definitely a lot of vitamin B, vitamin C, and calcium, which you just don't see that. You usually think of calcium for dairy products. And we need calcium not only to build our bones, um, but also for every um, muscle movement that we make when you blink your eyes, when you, you know, walk down the street, you need calcium for every muscle signal that you have. There's these calcium ion channels that are constantly opening and closing and, and allowing your muscles to contract and relax. So um, you need calcium every single day, um, all over your body and every cell of your body. So um, this is something, you know, we always think, oh, drink milk, it's rich in calcium. There's lots of other foods that are rich in calcium too. So don't worry if you're a vegan and you wanted to make sure you get enough calcium and protein, just give me a call um, and we can talk about what you would need to make sure that um, your body is strong and healthy as you age, um, especially if you're a person of childbearing age, we could definitely talk about it. Um, but tartaric acid. So acids are sour. It means they have a low pH. And tartaric acid in particular um, is really useful if you've ever done any baking and you use baking powder. Baking powder consists of two things. It consists of baking soda and tartaric acid. Baking soda is alkaline and, baking, and, uh, and tartaric acid is acidic and they're a powder. So you mix them together and they don't react. And then you add water or milk or something into your batter and it causes an acid-based reaction like you can get this reaction if you mix together baking soda and vinegar, because vinegar is acetic acid. And you'll see that bubbling, 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 bubbling. That's called an acid-base reaction. And so that's why when you bake and you add baking soda to it, as soon as you add the water, you need to stir it and get it in the oven right away, because that reaction only goes for so long. And you want that reaction to be going on when you pop it into the oven, it starts to rise, and then all of your, your carbon dioxide has gone away, and you want to sort of bake your structure so that it's got all those little holes in it. So next time you eat a muffin, look at all those tiny little holes in it. And that usually is because of baking powder. And so that's tartaric acid and baking soda mixed together. So if anybody asks you, what's the difference between baking soda and baking powder? Baking powder has baking soda in it, but it also has tartaric acid in it too. So um, before we get to questions, I had one other thing that was super interesting that I learned today because I've always looked at, I've talked about tamarind for years among other uh, weird fruits and vegetables, but I never really looked into the uses of the seeds. So um, the seeds have that shiny outer coating on them, and if you swallow it, it's just going to pass right through you. That seed coat is very strong and heavy, and it wouldn't hurt you if you crunched it up and eat it, but it doesn't taste very good, and it would probably make your mouth feel sort of mealy because it is a very effective emulsifier, which is something that mixes together, um, uh, it mixes together water and oil, um, sort of like soap does. Is, that's an emulsifier, um, or lemon juice when you make mayonnaise. Um, but it also is an, a very effective thickener. So while you can't go and buy tamarind powder, tamarind powder seed, you know, isolated uh, polysaccharides, you'd have to buy them. You can't buy them at the grocery store as an ingredient. You would have to buy them from a chemical company. What they've done is they isolate these 
They're called polysaccharides. They're like fibers. And uh, they uh, put them, they use them industrially in mayonnaise, pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, low-fat milk, juice, things like that. So a lot of people think when you go to the um, grocery store and you pick up a bottle of juice and it looks like perfectly, you don't have to shake it up. There's no different layers of anything. Um, it's just one solid, you know, you go cranberry juice, apple juice, pineapple juice, and they, it all looks uniform, ho like homogenized, basically. It's like a uniform liquid. But actually, if you fresh squeeze any juice, you're going to have layers of pulp. You're going to have some stuff with the sediment at the bottom. And so in order for consumers to expect the same product all the time and not have to shake it before they use it or think that something weird is growing in it, they will put pectins or thickeners in juices, milks, things like that, so that they stay, um, they stay homogenized, where it looks the same from the very top to the very bottom. You don't have any kind of settling or anything. So uh, the tamarind seed has actually used as an application for that because you have to use very little of it to, for it to thicken something, for it to bind to other molecules, to mix it together because you'll have a little bit of fat floating in a little bit of water like in low fat milk. If, you know, if you've ever had milk fresh out of a cow, um, there's always a layer of cream on top, there's like a watery area in the middle and there's a little bit of sediment of proteins at the bottom. Nobody would drink milk in the grocery store like that if they saw it, unless they, you know, unless they knew about it um, ahead of time. But milk, when it comes out of a cow, doesn't look like that. And cranberry juice doesn't come out of a cranberry looking like that. They have to put emulsifiers and stabilizers in it to make it look like that. And tamarind seed is one of many of the ingredients that may be in some of those particular juices that you pick up so that, uh, so that they'll look... Um, they'll look tasty to the American consumer, basically. Cosmetically perfect. We, we're used to eating cosmetically perfect food when we shop at the grocery store all the time. And so I thought that was really interesting. But also that, uh, that emulsifying and thickening that the tamarind seed does, I found out they also used it in brick making and explosives. Don't ask me how, but they do. I read it in a scientific article today and it blew my mind. And so that's why I think it's, really great especially for my young seeds kids out there to know that to pick something that you're really interested in for a vocation a job because you will learn forever and be constantly fascinated food happens to be mine and i'm constantly fascinated i can never learn enough i the more you read the more you know i feel like the more i learn the less i know um, but it's fascinating every single time that i research that i learn something new and interesting about something that i've even been talking about for years so um, let me see, was there anything else I wanted to tell you about that? Oh, um, I wanted to mention for my gardeners out there and for those of you that are learning about gardening, um, including my seeds kids, uh, this is a leguminous tree. So a legume is something it's a, it, that, uh, that creates like a bean. So that could be green beans, it could be mesquite trees, um, it could be hairy vetch, um, that bean is really tiny, um, but all of these are leguminous plants. and what that one family of plants have in common is that they capture atmospheric nitrogen and they trap it in the plant. And then the way they do that is by little nodules on their roots. They're like little apartments for bacteria called rhizobia. And these little bacteria are not the plant. They're buddies with the plant and they're in a symbiotic relationship, an interdependent relationship where they do things for each other. So the rhizobia capture this atmospheric nitrogen and feed it to the plant. And then the plant uses the nitrogen and then it captures light and air and creates starch in the form of sugars and feeds it to the bacteria. So they're little buddies and they do good things for each other. Um, this plant, um, along with your green beans and your cow peas and your butter beans, which are all leguminous plants, this is another one of those types of plants. Even though it's a 60 foot tree, it has the same type of rhizobia in its roots and has this symbiotic interdependent relationship with, uh, with, with each other so that they can be stronger. And then what's great is when that plant dies or when parts of it fall down, like its leaves or even the pods, um, when they break down, they add nitrogen back to the soil. So it's a nice uh, circular, you know, circle of life situation that not only benefits that particular plant, but other plants around it that grow around it. So, so that's about all I wanted to say about tamarind. Does anybody have any questions? 
Oh yeah, we've got lots of questions. Um, so first, Kelly just wanted to tell you that hers is very sour too. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have some folks with some sweet teeth. Um, so one person wants to know, can you make candy out of it? And another person, what about, um, have you tried it as an ice cream flavor? Oh my gosh, yes. I've had it as ice cream, I've had it as sherbet, I've had it as cake. Um, you can make candy out of it. Um, I, my buddy, I have a fellow culinary crusader friend in Tucson, and uh, we used to come up with these, that was our little club name, we called each other the culinary crusaders, and her and I were kind of the leaders of this group, and then uh, she would bring in other people, and one time she called me and said, I'm obsessed with this tamarind, I, you know, I want to learn about it, and I want to do stuff with it, and I said, well, let's buy a wholesale case of this, it was like 100 pounds. And fortunately, in my house, I have a big kitchen with big pots and things like that. Plus, at my work, I always have that stuff, too. So um, we got, <laughs> we cracked apart. It took us like a whole weekend. We cracked apart 100 pounds of these, isolated every single one, put them in a big pot, mixed them with water, and cooked all the tamarind off of the seeds, and then uh, strained out all the seeds, and then dehydrated it, and made it into these little balls that we rolled in sugar. Now, you could just speed that up and get yourself some that's already done um, so that you can make your own candy out of it. There's lots of ways to make candy out of this. You can, because it's so sour, you, you know, you're definitely probably gonna wanna add a little bit of sugar to it, but you can bake it into all kinds of things. You can make little fruit chews out of it. You could mix it in with other fruit pulps and dehydrate it so that it's like a, um, like a fruit roll up um, with tamarind and apple and banana if you want. There's a lot of different ways to make this uh, sweet and savory. So yeah, you can definitely make candy out of it. Mm, getting me hungry as usual. Um, so we're looking for some other recipes. The first one is for other fruit mixes that you could use with it in for a summer drink. Oh my gosh, anything. So if you think about like the flavor, it is sort of tropical, but it's very sour. I mean, you can add anything to it. Banana, apple, pineapple, mango, papaya, um, you know, none of those things really have uh, calcium either. So it's kind of nice to add it as like a little extra kick in something that's really, really sweet. So um, smoothies are good. Popsicles are awesome. Um, yeah, you can, you can mix all kinds of things with it. I've never done anything like berries though, just because berries are such a different kind of fruit. And I tend to link like tropicals with tropicals and then old world fruits with other old world fruits. Um, but you could, you could try grape. Grape is also very rich in tartaric acid. Um, they use it also in winemaking, so they isolate the tartaric acid. And um, even though um, grapes have a lot of tartaric acid in them, they add extra to add flavor to the wine, but then also inhibit bacterial growth because the more acidic something is, the less bacteria can grow in it. Um, but yeah, you can mix it with all different kinds of fruits. Your, let your imagination run wild, really. Another one that I thought would be good would be like prickly pear, if you've ever had, um, uh, the Opuntia family of cacti, they actually grow here. Maybe I'll bring one of those on uh, if I can find them. We may have to wait till September till they're in season, but there's a cactus around here. There are very few cacti that grow around here. And there's one, it's an Opuntia cactus, it's called a prickly pear, um, called Novalitos in um, Mexican cuisine. But that's the pad of the cactus, but then it puts off this little, um, pink pink to purple fruit depending on the variety and it's like seedy on the inside and it's a little bit sour but it's also sweet and kind of earthy i think that would be an excellent pair for something a pairing uh for something like this but then pears would be too so whatever you want to make more sour and give it like a kick this is a great addition to that awesome um and then other recipes you would recommend that are not candy ice cream or drinks <laughs> So this is also used in savory. So, um, you know, uh, I really love it. Like they, they use it in Jamaican cooking, in soups um, and in curries. Like I love Jamaican curries, they're my favorite. Um, it, and it adds like a sourness to it. Um, sometimes you can find this whole tree is sour. So occasionally when they're in season, you can find the flowers and the tips of the leaves from this tree in Indian grocery stores. And you can fry those up with uh, like in a stir fry. Um, and it also adds that sort of um, pungent uh, sour kick. I guess anything that you would put lemon in. Um, but yeah, the, you should try the chutneys if you've never made a tamarind chutney or had a tamarind chutney. I highly recommend it. Um, it's, there, it's really great with uh, oily things, like things that are fried, um, because it, it sort of 
cuts the the oiliness um, and really adds like a nice kick. Um, and when you have sour things, they bring out the flavor of other things in dishes. So I would say chutneys, soups, curries, um, you know, hmm. I would say if you're interested in it, you should buy some of it. And then, you know, you could do a web search for like, um, uh, you know, tamarind Philippine cuisine or tamarind, you know, South Indian cuisine, tamarind um, uh, Chinese cuisine or Taiwanese cuisine. And a lot of different recipes will come up that I've tried a lot of different stuff, but there's just so much out there um, where you can add it to all different kinds of sauces, soups, um, you know, stir fries, things like that. So the world is your oyster. <laughs> Great. Um, so for our last question, it's about the seeds. So are the seeds replanted to grow a tree or, and or do the seeds have any benefit to them? You know, I don't know the biological diversity of the seeds when you plant them. So um, for those of you, my gardeners out there, you know, or th those of you that aren't, if you take an apple, you know, your average gala apple or red delicious apple and you bite into it and you get down to the seeds, if you planted every single seed in that apple, every single one would give you a different tree that tasted nothing like the red delicious apple. That's got a lot of diversity, genetic diversity in each. And I mean, off that whole tree, it'll put off a thousand pounds of fruit and every single seed of every single apple that year will put off a different tree. I don't know if tamarind is the same way because um, there's only, um, I mean, there's a few different varieties that have been developed as it's been spread over thousands of years from Africa around the world. Um, I guess there, uh, there are red varieties and then sweet varieties depending on where you are. Um, but normally if you like a certain variety of, of tree, um, you would uh, either do air layering, that's where, you know, if there's a branch of a tree, you can wrap it in, um, in moss and then it will put off and, and wrap it so it's dark inside of there and it'll put off roots and then you can cut it off and stick it in the ground and it'll grow a whole new tree. So they've done that, they've done bud grafting, um, and you can plant from seed and get another tamarind tree. You're gonna get pods off of it. I just don't know if they're gonna come true to type. For my new gardeners out there, that means if you plant, you know, if you plant the seed of something that you're gonna get the same thing that you tasted when you tasted the parent, um, where like apples will never come true to type. You have to clone them. You have to, you know, take a little piece off of it and put it into a rootstock in order to get that same apple. So it's genetically a clone. Every gala apple you've ever had is exactly the same as the first one that was ever found because they're genetically clones of one another. Whereas um, with tamarind, um, I, think you're going to get a little bit of genetic diversity, but I don't, I don't know. I'll look in to see how different each one of them would be. Uh, but they're all going to have edible tamarind, whereas like with apples, a lot of, a lot of apples are not edible. You can make um, alcohol out of them. Um, you can make uh, cider, you know, in cider or hard cider. Um, but a lot of them you can't eat out of hand. Some of them are so bitter you wouldn't eat them and you mainly would like, um, you know, feed livestock or something with them. So, but with tamarind, no matter what you plant, I know that you would still get an ed edible tamarind pot off of it. But if there's a particular variety, either if you wanted like that really long, you know, Asian variety that has 20 seeds in it, then you would um, grow it for that, you know, grow it for the seed. But you also want to consider where you picked it. So um, in Southern Florida around Miami, this is primarily where, um, and in Southern California, this is primarily where we grow tamarind in this country. We're not a major producer of tamarind um, since it's not really popular in American cuisine um, at all. <laughs> uh, but, um, and I'm not really sure how they propagate them there, but um, since it's warm, um, you know, they, they I know they, they propagate particular types, but these are gonna be different than the ones that grow like in the Arab world off the side of a mountain over an ocean. Um, those ones are going to be more tolerant to like salt spray, where in Florida, unless you're growing right on the coast, you're not necessarily going to need that. So I think it's more important to select the proper climate of where you're selecting that tree based on familiarity with or, or similarity with the climate where you're going to be planting it. Awesome. Well, that's all we have time for today, but we want you to come back next week, right, Sherilyn? Come back next week. I still haven't decided what we're going to do. I got to hit the grocery stores and see what looks good, but uh, I'm sure it will be equally interesting and delicious. Thank you all. Thanks, Sherilyn. I'm going to close Thank this you. out now. See you next week. Bye.